Welcome to Music History Monday for April 24th, 2023. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is A Voice Like Butter. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music, where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. We mark the birth on April 24th, 1942, 81 years ago today, of the American singer, songwriter, actress, and filmmaker Barbara Joan Streisand in Brooklyn, New York. But first, before we get to the magnificent Babs, a brief but spirited edition of This Day in Music History. Okay, stupid is too strong a word, so let's just call it This Day in Music History Dumb. On April 24, 2007, 16 years ago today, the American musician, actress, singer, and songwriter Cheryl Crow, born 1962, declared on her website that in order to help the environment, the use of toilet paper should be limited to, and we quote, only one square per restroom visit, except, of course, on those pesky occasions where two to three could be required, unquote. Yeah, we cannot help but wonder precisely what pesky occasions Crow might be referring to. Additionally, we must assume that Ms. Crow's proscription against TP overuse was intended to be voluntary, as the issues surrounding enforcement are indeed troubling. Cheryl Crow's environmental concerns extended as well to what she deemed to be the profligate use of napkins. She went so far as to design a line of clothing that features what she called a dining sleeve. Those sleeves, what amounted to wearable napkins, were replaceable. They could be detached after diners had used them to wipe their mouths and replaced with clean sleeves. What a shock! The dining sleeves never caught on. While we would acknowledge that Cheryl Crow's environmental heart is in the right place, we would respectfully suggest she aim a bit higher than toilet paper and, for example, stop drinking from plastic water bottles, as seen in the image attached to this post. Just suggesting. Barbara Streisand, born 1942. There is nothing I can say about Maestra Streisand that has not already been said a thousand times regarding her talents as a singer, actress, and filmmaker, her command of the stage, her intelligence and sense of humor, her ego and ambition, her philanthropy and activism, the cliches be damned. She is truly a force of nature and one of a kind. She has been a constant presence in our cultural lives for seven, seven decades. Her first network television appearance occurred on April 5th, 1961, when she appeared on the Jack Parr Show, later The Tonight Show, which was guest hosted that evening by Orson Bean. 1928 to 2020. Bean later recalled, quote, I met Barbara when she was 18 and singing at a place in Greenwich Village. When I guest hosted the Jack Parr show, I got them to fly her in from a club she was playing in Detroit. She was a nervous wreck. But then when she started singing the song, A Sleepin' Bee, it was like God singing through her. She got a standing ovation, which doesn't happen on TV. It was an incredible moment." Unquote. That performance of A Sleepin' Bee 
with music by Harold Arlen and words by Truman Capote, took place over 62 years ago. After performing the song, Streisand left the stage, changed clothes, and came out for another song, and then sat down with the other guests, who included Phyllis Diller, with whom Babs became great friends. The entire episode is linked to this post. Any attempt to detail Streisand's extraordinary life, career, and accomplishments will, by necessity, be the length of a 19th century Russian novel. I will be forgiven then for delegating the job of briefly summarizing Streisand's career and accomplishments to what are the opening three paragraphs of Wikipedia's 110 paragraph article on Streisand. Quote, Streisand began her career by performing in nightclubs and Broadway theaters in the early 1960s. Following her guest appearances on various television shows, she signed to Columbia Records and released her debut album, the Barbara Streisand Album, in 1963, which won the Grammy Award for Album of the Year. Throughout her recording career, Streisand has topped the U.S. Billboard 200 chart with 11 albums, including People, 1964, The Way We Were, 1974, Guilty, 1980, and the Broadway Album, 1985. She also achieved five number one singles on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100, The Way We Were, Evergreen, You Don't Bring Me Flowers, No More Tears, Enough is Enough, and Woman in Love. Following her established recording success in the 1960s, Streisand ventured into film by the end of that decade. She starred in the critically acclaimed Funny Girl, 1968, for which she won the Academy Award for Best Actress. Additional fame followed, with films including the extravagant musical Hello, Dolly, 1969, the screwball comedy What's Up, Doc? 1972, and the romantic drama The Way We Were, 1973. Streisand won a second Academy Award for writing the love theme from A Star Is Born, 1976, the first woman to be honored as a composer. With the release of Yentl, 1983, Streisand became the first woman to write, produce, direct, and star in a major studio film. The film won an Oscar for Best Original Score and a Golden Globe for Best Motion Picture Musical. Streisand also received the Golden Globe Award for Best Director, becoming the first, and for 37 years, the only woman to win that award. Streisand later directed The Prince of Tides, 1991, and The Mirror Has Two Faces, 1996. With sales exceeding 150 million records worldwide, Streisand is one of the best-selling recording artists of all time. Billboard ranked Streisand as the greatest solo artist on the Billboard 200 chart and the top adult contemporary female artist of all time. She is among the very few performers awarded an Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony. Her accolades include those two Academy Awards, 10 Grammy Awards, including the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award and the Grammy Legend Award, five Emmy Awards, four Peabody Awards, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and nine Golden Globes. Unquote. You got all of that? I'll tell you now, it will be on the midterm. In researching this post, three things in particular struck me about Barbara Streisand. One, the astonishing maturity of her singing voice from the get-go. Two, her singular insistence on managing her life and career her way, and the controversy that created in the 1960s and 1970s. And three, 
how her singular ambition to be famous shaped her childhood and adolescence. We will deal with her astonishing voice and personal management style here and now. Tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes post will deal with her childhood, her ambition, and the degree to which the movie Funny Girl is not just about the rags-to-riches story of the Ziegfeld Follies star Fanny Bryce, but about Ms. Streisand herself. The Voice Barbara Streisand knew she could sing from a young age. Growing up in Brooklyn, New York, she recalled sitting and singing on the stairs, also known as the stoop, in front of her apartment building with her friends. According to Streisand, and we quote, I was considered the girl on the block with the good voice, unquote. Be that as it may, her burning ambition was to be an actress. Having graduated from Erasmus Hall High School in January 1959 at the age of 16, she rented a tiny apartment in Manhattan's theater district on 48th Street and took virtually any job she could if it involved the theater. Among those jobs was ushering for The Sound of Music in early 1960. During the run, the casting director was looking for singers. Streisand auditioned, and although she did not get a gig, she was strongly encouraged by those who heard her to actively pursue work as a singer. At the time, Streisand had a boyfriend, an up-and-coming actor, singer, and songwriter named Barry Denon, 1938 to 2017. She asked him to help her make a demo tape, which together they did. Denon later confessed to being gobsmacked by what he heard, quote, We spent the afternoon taping, and the moment I heard the first playback, I went insane. This nutty little kook had one of the most breathtaking voices I'd ever heard. When she was finished and I turned off the machine, I needed a long moment before I dared look up at her." Unquote. Denon helped Babs put together a brief nightclub act and then managed to convince her to sign up for a talent contest at a gay nightclub in Greenwich Village called The Lion on West 9th Street. Quote, she performed two songs, after which there was a stunned silence from the audience, followed by thunderous applause when she was pronounced the winner. Unquote. The management of the Lion liked young Streisand so much that she continued to sing at the club for the next few weeks. And that is how Barbara Streisand's singing career began. By the way, it was during her run at the Lion that she dropped the second A from her given name, Barbara, and that she began fending off the endless suggestions that she get a nose job, without which, so she was told, she could never be a star. Within a few months, the 19-year-old Streisand had appeared on The Jack Parr Show, after which her fellow guest, Phyllis Diller, called her, quote, one of the great singing talents in the world." Unquote. By the time she was 20, Streisand was being compared to Lena Horne, Judy Garland, Edith Piaf, and Fanny Bryce. After hearing her nightclub act, the syndicated columnist Robert Ruark presciently wrote, quote, Her name is Barbara Streisand. She is 20 years old. She has a three-octave range. She packs more personal dynamic power than anybody I can recall since Helen Morgan. She can sing as loud as Ethel Merman and as persuasively as Lena Horne or Ella Fitzgerald, or as brassy as Sophie Tucker. Only Barbara Streisand can turn Crimea River into something comparable to Enrico Caruso having his first bash at Pagliacci. When Streisand cries you a river, you got a river. She will be around 
50 years from now if good songs are still written to be sung by good singers." Unquote. Streisand was a complete natural. She was nearly pitch perfect from day one, and she became pitch perfect by day two, perhaps day three. A natural mezzo-soprano, she developed her signature singing style, called by one wag, quote, a suspension bridge between old-school belting and microphone pop, unquote, entirely on her own, a sometimes husky, sometimes velvety, always crystal clear voice famously described as being like butter. Whitney Balliet, 1926 to 2007, a jazz and book critic for The New Yorker from 1954 to 2001, wrote, quote, Streisand wows her listeners with her shrewd dynamics, in your ear soft here, elbowing loud there, her bravura climbs, her rolling vibrato, and the singular Streisand from Brooklyn nasal quality of her voice a voice as immediately recognizable in its way as Louis Armstrong's." Unquote. My Way or the Highway From the very beginning of her career, Barbara Streisand insisted on doing things her way. When she was just 21, she signed a recording contract with Columbia Records. In exchange for less money up front, she insisted on and received full creative control over her recordings. The president of Columbia Records, Goddard Lieberson, was none too happy with her attitude, but he signed her anyway. Years later, Streisand remembered, quote, The most important thing about that first contract, actually the thing we held out for, was a unique clause giving me the right to choose my own material. It was the only thing I really cared about. I still received lots of pressure from the label to include some pop hits on my first album, but I held out for the songs that really meant something to me." Unquote. Columbia wanted to call that first album Sweet and Saucy Streisand. Exercising her creative control, Streisand nixed the title and instead insisted that the record be called the Barbara Streisand Album. Her logic was simple, quote, if you saw me on TV, you could just go to the record shop and ask for the Barbara Streisand Album. It's common sense, unquote. Yes, it was. The Barbara Streisand Album scored the top 10 on the Billboard chart and went on to win three Grammy Awards, making Streisand the best-selling female vocalist in the United States and establishing her as being, quote, the most exciting new personality since Elvis Presley, unquote. The Reputation In the male-dominated entertainment industry, Streisand was notable for all of her firsts as a woman. The first woman to win a Golden Globe Award for Best Director. The first woman to earn an Academy Award as a composer. The first woman to write, produce, direct, and star in a major studio film, and so forth. Unfortunately, all of these firsts say as much about the dreadful state of sexual equality at the time she broke into the industry as they do about Barbara Streisand herself. Truly, she had the chutzpah, the willingness, the smarts, and the talent to venture where no woman had gone before, and she paid for it. She was called pushy, difficult, shrill, and a bitch. Double standard words all. An ambitious man is assertive. An ambitious woman is pushy. An outspoken man is forthright. An outspoken woman is called shrill. An exacting man is a perfectionist. An exacting woman 
is called difficult. A strong man is called uncompromising. A strong woman is called a bitch. Barbara Streisand's reputation for being all of the above dogged her until the times, albeit slowly, began to catch up with her. Love her or not, we must respect her. Not for just her talent and extraordinary artistic legacy, but for virtually creating a new sort of star. One who didn't change her name. Yeah, taking a single letter out of Barbara does not constitute a name change, or get a nose job, or allow anyone to tell her how to run her life and career. Rather, as Pauline Kael observed apropos of Streisand in her review of the movie Funny Girl in The New Yorker, quote, it's been commonly said that Funny Girl was a comfort to people because it carried the message that you do not need to be pretty to succeed. That is nonsense. The message of Barbara Streisand in Funny Girl is that talent is beauty. And this isn't some comforting message for plain people. It's what show business is all about. Unquote. We conclude this post with an anecdote that stands as a magnificent example of Streisand's reputation in the 1970s. It's a story that stems from the 1976 remake of King Kong, a movie produced by the Italian-born action movie mogul Augustino Dino De Laurentiis, 1919-2010. In the original 1933 version of King Kong, the lead female character was named Anne Darrow. Darrow, the beauty that killed the beast, was played by the actress Faye Ray, 1907-2004, whose youth, blondness, ingenue-like beauty, and ability to scream nonstop for the duration of the film qualified her for the role. In the 1976 remake, that character was named Dwan, not Dawn, and was played by the young, blonde, and ingenue-like beauty Jessica Lange, born 1949. Meryl Streep, also born 1949, auditioned for the role, but was deemed by De Laurentiis as not being pretty enough for the role. Now, according to some sources, De Laurentiis offered the role to the not-so-young, 34-year-old, not-blonde, not-ingenue-like beauty, Barbara Streisand, who turned it down. This rings entirely false, and false it is. In fact, Streisand wanted the role of Dwan, which she saw as an opportunity to rebrand herself as an action star. But De Laurentiis would not hear of it, and when asked in an interview why Streisand wasn't offered the part, he famously answered, quote, because it's so no good to have a two monsters in a one a movie, unquote. A great line, but painfully telling. Like so many men of his generation, Dino De Laurentiis was put off by Barbara Streisand. Having been born in 1919 and raised in Naples, Italy, he was, if nothing else, a man of his place and time, a man woefully unprepared to deal with a woman and artist like Barbara Streisand. As opposed to, for example, someone like me. As the son, grandson, nephew, and cousin of a large number of smart, outspoken, talented, Brooklyn-born Jewish women. I grew up thinking that women like Barbara Streisand were the norm. I learned early on that to treat them disrespectfully was to tread most dangerously. Tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes post will tackle the movie Funny Girl as a biography of both the vaudeville star Fanny Bryce and Barbara Streisand and will examine Streisand's performance as among the greatest film debuts 
of all time. Thank you. To sample and download one or all of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com.